Hello everyone, uh, I'm Leo Stone and this is Full Speed Fuzzing, Reducing Fuzzing Overhead Through Coverage Guided Tracing. So bugs in software can cause serious real world harm to people. Uh, so I have two examples here. On the left this is the uh, Therac 25 Computer Controlled Radiation Therapy System. Uh, so this was basically a computer hooked up to a radiation gun and the computer was running the software uh, that would help doctors basically figure out uh, how much radiation to give to the patients uh, but unfortunately it had a race condition that would cause it to give way more than it was supposed to under certain circumstances uh, so that killed multiple people uh, and then on the right this is the uh, WannaCry ransomware decryptor interface uh, that was a ransomware that um, hit lots of uh, big companies and institutions. Um, so in both of these cases there was an underlying software flaw. Um, in the case of the radiation therapy system it was just a malfunction that caused the harm uh, and in the case of the ransomware it was a vulnerability in Windows that was exploited. Uh, but in both cases there was an underlying flaw in software uh, that caused real-world harm to people. So it's the job of software developers and security analysts to find those flaws uh, and fix them uh, before they can actually cause harm. Uh, and we have a few traditional techniques for doing that. So there is uh, unit tests, which is where you write some code that tests your code and that uh, code will essentially uh, check that your code performs a certain way, meets certain conditions. Uh, then there's QA testing, so basically we're going to hire some team of people to sit there with your program uh, and maybe try to use it in unintended ways and break it, see if they can find some flaws in it. Uh, and then there's manual analysis, so basically we're going to hire somebody to come look at your program uh, just see if they can find some error you've made by reading your source code, typically, or something like that. Uh, and these all have one thing in common, which is that they all involve humans. Uh, and humans have some inherent limitations because we can only do so much in one day, uh, and we can only hold so much in our brains at one time. So fuzzing is another technique for discovering bugs and programs uh, except the idea with fuzzing is that we're going to actually use a computer to discover bugs and programs automatically. So that's without any active human participation. Um, and so the idea here is sort of um, a human can understand programs at a deep level by reading them. Computers can't really do that yet, uh, but what they do have is just raw computational power. Uh, a human can't sit there and test you know, 2,300 inputs every single second. Uh, that's just not physically possible. But a computer can do that. Um, and so these sort of differences in the way humans are able to test software and the way a computer can test software with a fuzzer uh, sort of means that fuzzers will tend to find bugs that would be hard for humans to find, like maybe some very complex interaction uh, that would be difficult to actually understand uh, but a fuzzer could find that just through sheer brute force and testing millions of inputs every day. Um, so fuzzing basically offers this complementary approach to uh, human-based software testing, um, and it's actually very effective. Uh, so it works in three main steps. First, there's input generation. Um, so we're fuzzing some program uh, that parses an input. So that could be, for example, like an archive utility. Um, maybe we're fuzzing tar or 7-zip or something. Uh, so in that case, our input is just going to be the file that has the compressed archive in it. Um, and then the program is going to take that file, uh, process it, and then produce some output, like the extracted files. Uh, maybe it's a website, and in that case, the program takes input in the form of some network packets and then it's going to conditionally uh, do something based on the content of those packets, maybe send something back to the client or something like that. Um, but at a high level, 
we're taking in some form of input and in step one we generate that input that we're going to give to the program um, so then we have step two which is execution and that's where we're just going to execute the program that we're testing um, so we're going to take that input we generated in step one then we're going to execute the program uh, and give it that input and side note this is where we spend about 95% uh, of our time typically during fuzzing uh, and then finally we have the triage step which is where we observe the result of processing that input on the program so we see uh, we ran the program we give it that input what actually happened um, and one thing I want to highlight here is sort of as I said earlier uh, the advantage of fuzzing or more generally using a computer to test programs is not that the computer can understand what's going on at a deep level. It's really uh, the brute computational force of the computer um, that's where fuzzing has an advantage over humans. Um, and also cost. That's important too. But sort of at a high level, we're kind of just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks in the case of a lot of fuzzers. Um, not always. There are more intelligent fuzzing techniques we'll see later in the presentation, but um, typically that's a lot of what we're doing in fuzzing. So generally faster fuzzing equals more effective fuzzing. And this is just a more detailed diagram of those steps. So first we generate the test case, then we execute the target binary, um, and then finally we triage the result of that execution. Um, so maybe uh, the program didn't really do anything particularly interesting. And in that case, we're just going to throw that input away because uh, it doesn't really tell us anything new. We don't really care about uh, that input. Uh, maybe it did something kind of interesting. And in that case, we're going to save the program so that we can use it as the basis for future test cases. Um, maybe the program did something really interesting. Maybe it did something that actually indicates that there's a bug. Maybe it crashed. Um, and in that case, we're going to want to put that input aside uh, so that a human can come look at it later and try to figure out um, what the underlying bug was that that program uncovered, or that that uh, test case uncovered. Uh, and so on the last slide, I mentioned this notion of uh, a test case being interesting. Uh, and typically in a fuzzer that takes the form of uh, code coverage. So a lot of people are probably familiar with this on the left here. This is a screenshot from a JUnit test. So this is just showing you which lines of code your test actually executed. So how much of your code your test actually covered. Um, and then at the level of a compiled binary, um, rather than looking at lines of source code, then you would start looking at uh, basic blocks. And basic blocks are just uh, linear sequences of assembly instructions that will always be executed uh, in that order. Uh, so they're basically the smallest unit of a program's control flow at the binary level. Um, and so because fuzzers often work with binaries, uh, code coverage collected by fuzzers uh, is often done on a per basic block uh, basis. So then a coverage guided fuzzer is one that collects code coverage uh, from the program it's running and uses that code coverage to inform its future mutation. Um, so it does that through instrumenting the binary typically that could be static so it's like added in uh, and then doesn't change or it could be um, added in to the binary at runtime um, and so the idea with this is we're going to add some instrumentation to the binary um, to tell us about which regions of the code each test case executes um, because uh, you can think of a program sort of from the perspective of a fuzzer um, as being a sequence of control flow decisions uh, 
and we're only going to see bugs uh, on certain paths of control flow decisions. Um, so in order to try to get to those paths, uh, we want to try and cover all of those potential control flows to try and find um, the ones that might have bugs on them. So that translates to um, an input is typically interesting uh, if it reaches some basic block or basic block edge uh, that we previously hadn't seen during fuzzing. And that would be the criteria for saving it. Or um, And so collecting this code coverage from a running binary uh, is called tracing. So you're running the binary with this instrumentation and then creating this trace of which regions of the code it executed and doing that is slow. Um, so when a coverage guided fuzzer runs uh, typically it's going to create that trace for every single input that it tests. Um, but one of the most important ideas behind this paper is that most of the inputs that we test during fuzzing don't actually produce any new coverage. Uh, and so if you recall from that earlier slide when I showed the uh, breakdown of the triage step, um, if an input doesn't produce any new code coverage, um, we're probably not going to consider it interesting, so we're probably just going to throw it away. And if we throw it away, we're kind of uh, wasting all of this execution time that we spend doing this slow uh, code coverage tracing because um, we're just throwing that input away. So in the common case here, uh, in a coverage guided fuzzer, um, we're going to trace this full code coverage and it's going to be slow and then we're basically just going to throw that trace away because um, we're going to check it and see that the binary, uh, that the test case that we just ran didn't see any new code coverage, so we're kind of wasting our time here. So this brings us to the idea behind the paper, which is coverage guided tracing. So what if instead of just tracing code coverage for every single input unconditionally, um, we instrumented the target binary differently so that it would only report uh, to us if we hit new regions of the program. Uh, so before we were uh, just reporting any time we hit a region of the program so that we would get a full trace of every single region that was executed, now we're just going to add instrumentation to the regions that we haven't seen yet. Um, so if we do this, uh, there will be no overhead uh, for the majority of test cases that we're executing um, because the majority of them don't see new code coverage, so they're not going to see any of our instrumentation. Uh, so only when we actually hit our instrumentation in these new undiscovered regions do we do this slow process of tracing uh, the target's full code coverage. Um, and then of course when we hit a new undiscovered region we also have to remove that region's instrumentation uh, so it's not considered new in the future. So uh, their implementation of this is called Untracer uh, and they implemented it uh, atop the very popular open source Linux fuzzer AFL in about 1200 lines of C and C++. Uh, and so their implementation works uh, by first creating two instrumented binaries uh, they call one the interest oracle and that's the one that's used for just general purpose execution so that's the one that only has instrumentation in the undiscovered regions of the program uh, and then they also have the tracer which is sort of your more standard uh, instrumented binary that will report every single uh, basic block that's hit so uh, what this actually looks like at the implementation level is uh, for the interest oracle, we're just going to put a hex CC, which is a breakpoint instruction, uh, at the beginning of every undiscovered basic block. Uh, so what this is going to do uh, is it's going to raise a breakpoint exception uh, 
when we reach any undiscovered basic block. So we're going to raise this exception, uh, and we can install an exception handler for this breakpoint exception uh, so that we can be notified whenever that happens. And then we can catch that exception uh, and mark that input as coverage producing and also take off that breakpoint. Um, so this way, if we don't reach any new basic blocks again, uh, we're not hitting any of these breakpoint instructions, and then we're literally just executing the exact same code that you would be executing uh, running the program outside of the fuzzer, so there's no performance penalty. Uh, and then for the tracer binary, uh, they used uh, Dynanst to uh, add some more complicated instrumentation to the beginning of every uh, basic block that would just report that full coverage trace. Um, and both of these binaries uh, contained a fork server, um, which is basically a way of sort of optimizing out some of the overhead associated with creating a new process um, by creating this server that will keep newly forked processes running for you, and then you can just ask it for a new process whenever you want one, and it has one that's already initialized uh, waiting for you, basically. So it just reduces some of the overhead associated with running a program over and over and over again, because you're skipping that program initialization. Uh, so here's a diagram of the whole thing. So we're starting with our uh, test cases and target binary over here on the left. Um, then we create the Oracle and the tracer binaries, so we're going to get that uh, list of basic blocks from the target binary and then use that to just put a hex CC at the beginning of every uh, basic block. Um, and then we can use that Oracle binary during fuzzing and then whenever we get one of those breakpoint instructions then we can bring in the slower tracer binary and trace the full coverage map. And then we use that uh, to take the breakpoints off of the Oracle binary uh, so that when we see those regions that we just discovered again, we're not going to get another breakpoint exception. And so to evaluate their implementation, uh, they used eight different open source uh, Linux benchmarks that were selected because they had a variety of different uses, basically. Uh, and they compared their implementation against uh, AFL with Clang, uh, AFL QMU, and AFL Dynanst. Uh, so basically they had one white box fuzzer, uh, which is a fuzzer that uses the source code of the program to compile an instrumentation. Uh, one uh, black box fuzzer, which means it just uses the binary, uh, and then AFL-QMU is uh, doing dynamic instrumentation, so it's inserting instrumentation at runtime, and then AFL-Dynanst is a black box static fuzzer, um, so it's going to insert uh, instrumentation into the binary once, and then just use that. Um, and the criteria for their evaluation was primarily just performance. So uh, what does the fuzzer overhead look like, in other words, uh, of their implementation versus these other popular Linux fuzzers? Um, so to evaluate that performance and fuzzer overhead, uh, what they did is basically uh, run one trial uh, on one specific fuzzer for all these benchmarks for 24 hours to create a really long list of uh, different mutated inputs. Uh, and then they used each of these fuzzers in their evaluation, uh, including their own fuzzer, and executed each of those inputs um, on each fuzzer. So that way, uh, each fuzzer is executing the exact same set of inputs. And the only thing you're comparing is uh, the performance of each fuzzer. You're not getting any uh, random mutations or any different behavior between the fuzzers. Uh, and here are the results. So on the left they have uh, the two black box fuzzers, AFL-QMU and AFL-Dynanst uh, versus them. So 
you can see they pretty solidly outperform the black box fuzzers um, in all except for really a couple cases here and on average you know they had at least a six times improvement so that's a pretty good result um, and then here on the right we have uh, AFL Clang the white box again that means basically source aware so we're inserting instrumentation at compile time and then using that binary um, so the performance is going to be better generally uh, for white box instrumentation uh, but still uh, they managed to outperform it on average by a pretty decent margin. And so they also did an evaluation of where the overhead was in their implementation. Uh, what they found was that most of it generally was in the tracing step, um, which is a pretty good result because they've already optimized out the expensive tracing step to only happen um, in the rare test cases that are coverage producing. So this indicates that uh, the rest of their system, which is the new stuff that they've added uh, to coverage guided fuzzing, um, is not as significant as the tracing step. Um, so although they uh, introduced more overhead in the tracing step than a traditional coverage guided fuzzer would. Uh, they found that was about like two times the normal execution time. Um, that's two times the normal execution time in the about one in 10,000 inputs that's actually coverage increasing. So uh, in fact, what they saw was a uh, very significant performance improvement uh, versus traditional coverage guided fuzzing.